Hello world, this is Jeffrey, JGB 14.6 Blake, coming to you with episode 12 of the Tales of Bulivolt. Today's episode is another special episode with special guest John Roberts II. He will be coming on for an interview talking about how he came up with this list, because he is the architect, he's the one who came up with it, and he's the one who piloted it to multiple top 32 finishes at Madison Regionals and at the North American Internationals. So without further ado, let's dig in. So I guess the first question I have is, you know, this is a very unique list, which, according to Team Fish Knuckles, is something you're kind of known for. But um, <laughs> what inspired you to go this direction? Well, like, it all basically started whenever, like, I would, you know, like, every time I was t uh, testing or if I was watching other people play, I noticed that a lot of decks were kind of stuck because like they were having cards that they couldn't use and uh one of those cards were having to you know having to be like be a seeker professor sycamore they'll have like too many of those in their hand and you know why pollute your deck with a bunch of stuff that you can't use uh as you draw it you know so like if you minimize supporters um or minimize things that you can't use then you're gonna have a much better chance of getting set up Sure. Yeah, I, I makes sense to me. Um, I I love the way the deck runs. I think I mentioned that <laughs> a lot. Um, <laughs> so, I guess the next thing, the list I have on the screen is the exact sixty that you posted on Hey Fonte, um, coming from your North American International. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you've changed since then? Or any changes you sort of think are worth making? Uh, well, I mean, after burning shadows, I may put in a second recycler, but that's about it. Uh, just to keep up with uh, Gardevoir, because you're gonna have to discard your energies to not get one hit KO'd. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, other than that, though, I mean, if I were to play against any other deck, I would just keep it the exact same. Okay. Would do you think? Guzma over Lysander, or do you think a 1-1 one -one split, or what? Oh, oh, well, uh, oh yeah, i definitely switch that out for Guzmas. Like, I'll put two Guzmas in yeah. instead of two Lysander. Um, that, yeah, that wouldn't be a question. Yeah. Uh, I think Guzmas far superior. Mm -hmm. Since it helps you with switching, and that's, that's one thing that, you know, this deck likes to do. And, and certainly, uh, an effective, the way that you can get, I think, it's like 12 or 13 virtual switches that we can get between the escape ropes and switches and Skylas and Ultra Balls for Lele. Yeah. Um, that's one reason why I put three Skylas in the deck because it essentially opens up pretty much any possibility any turn in the game mm -hmm. uh, instead of just drawing through your deck with N and Sycamore trying to hope to hit something. Sure. Uh, you can just guarantee yourself um, a certain card or a, a play for the following turn. Um, like, you know, if I already have a Grubbin on turn one, and I have a, you know, I have a, a Bulu to set up, and uh, my opponent does not uh, have a threatening uh, board, or or let's say, you know, they first turn of the game, they're not going to be able to knock out my Grubbin. You know, I'll Skyla for, you know, a Rare Candy or a Heavy Ball, and then have a Sycamore in my hand to follow up the next turn. Um you know, basically they'll they'll have to end, which you know I really don't care if they they end me. They'll give me a new hand anyway. So you know, pretty much uh, allow myself to uh, have as many options as possible. You know, like let's say I need a field blower for Garbatoxin. Um, I don't have to you know discard resources or have to shuffle my hand back in. You know, put myself to a low number of cards. You know, let's say I'm already taking two prizes. I'm only drawing four off of it, and you know I can just play a Skyla, get it to my hand take prizes, add more cards to my hand, um, and force my opponent to start playing their ends, and, you know, or the Sycamores to try to keep up, make them both through their resources, and you can kind of take advantage of it. Yeah, I think I think you touched on something there, saying they have to go through things to try to keep up. Uh, that, that definitely is a, a strength that I've found with the deck, too. I think you mentioned it first, but it's like your priority seems to more or less always be to get a Bulu and a Bulu into the active and a Vicavolt on the bench and and 
trying to do that like turn two to just start taking KOs and then from there it's like you almost don't have to worry about things because your opponents start inning and, and it's just like stuff just comes to you correct um, you know um, like uh, I've heard a lot of people say like well what do you do if you have a dead hand well my simple solution to that is just to take prizes in you know the more prizes you take uh, the less uh, supporters that you're going to need the following turn because you're going to take you know an extra card or two um, or even three with Coco, depending on how you set knockouts up. So I think I think that's one thing that I'm maybe not getting balanced right is is Coco's use in the deck. So can you elaborate on how you tend to use Coco? Is it pretty much always just flying flips? Oh no, I use, I've used Lucky Ball so many times. Okay. Uh, uh, pretty much what it what it's there for is not only for the free retreat. Um, especially with switches and escape ropes. Um, but uh, let's say, you know, I'm, I'm going against, like, Espeon Garbodor. Uh, actually, uh, I never fly and flip unless my opponent has EVs on the board, uh, just because the map doesn't work uh, at all against Garbodor, because you knock him out anyway. Mm-hmm. But uh, say, my opponent, my, say my opponent has a couple EVs on the board, or Espeon and EV, or two Espeons, any combination, I'll fly and flip, and then that way... I don't have to have a choice band on my Bulu mm-hmm. to knock out their Espeon. Uh, I can actually use uh, Nature's Judgment for 180, and then on top of that, they cannot return KO with uh, their uh, Trash Lance in, the, you know, in case that I have enough damage on it uh, to be able to, uh, for them to be able to knock it out without the Fury Belt. Mm-hmm. And then I can just use uh, the GX attack on the Garbodor and guess what? Now their Espeon still can't knock me on one hit because I have a Fury Belt. And I just one-shot them again. Makes sense. Yeah. So, you know, that's just, that's just an example. There's a lot more scenarios than that. Uh, sure. Especially, like, in the mirror match. Um, you know, being able to uh, put 20 on everything and then uh, Lysander up a, a Vicar Bolt with 20 damage on it. And then use the uh, Nature's Judgment for 120 uh, plus the 10 from the Fury Belt to knock out their Vickable, um, and then they can't return KO because even with the choice ban, they're still only doing 210 and I have 220, and then I can just 180 them. Yeah. Yeah. The Fury Belt definitely is, is clutch in a lot of matchups. I think the Mirror is a good example. Um, what I saw, too, was that it, it made it from uh, Zorark Drampa. It took that from being a, a pretty tough match once they got the Zor- Zorark Breakup to sort of being almost easy because you one-shot everything in a lot of cases without even discarding energy and now suddenly it's just like hey so yeah. that, uh, but that that actually does lead into another question I had uh, which is how do you decide like what scenarios do you choose a choice band versus a fury belt if you're, if you're looking at your hand and you've got a Fury Belt, and you've got a Choice Band, and you've got, you know, one one Bulu out, right? So that's the scenario. Mm-hmm. Um, what what are the factors that are going to make the difference between which one you choose? Well, um, I look at math, and then I look at uh, what attackers they have. Okay. Uh, so if, if Fury Belt will... Uh, well, that's... that's that goes back to why I included two type of Cocos uh, in the deck. But um, if there is a way I can actually attach a Fury Belt over a Choice Band, I will always do that. Um, so basically, because, the, the, it, let, me, uh, let me say what I think I'm hearing, and then you can tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, what, yeah. I, what I think you're saying sort of is that you want the extra HP from the Fury Belt, uh, so unless you have to have the Choice Band on there to get a one-hit KO, you do the Fury Belt? Correct. Um, a lot of times I'll attach the Choice Band to the Tapu Coco instead. Okay. So yeah, that, that way I can do 50 and then 20 to, to all the bench. Makes mm-hmm. things so much easier for Bulu, uh, especially with uh, having the Fury Belt, being able to uh, do 130 um, after doing 50 to an active, so all 180s get knocked out. And then uh, using the GX attack, I can knock out any 180s on the bench that were that, that took the 20 with the GX attack doing 160. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Alrighty. Um, are you are you going to the Anaheim Open? I was really going to, but um, I decided not to. Uh, just you know, it wasn't really worth uh, going if I wasn't actually going to play in the main events because uh, of the money situation. I mean, if sure. I mean, if I had money to spend, yes, I would definitely go because I mean, I really want to go. Sure. I'm I'm the same way. So, <laughs> uh, if you were going, would you take Bully Volt? Uh, I'd either take that or Guard of War. Sure. Um, Guard of War. That the oh, get rid of that. <laughs> uh, I mean, Volcano is also really good. I also consider that as well, but it's not my style deck. Uh, I'd rather I'd rather have a, a stage two deck. Uh. Yeah, it, the the two decks that I'm expecting to focus on going forward are this and and Volk. So <laughs> I guess I'm, <laughs> I'm I'm both directions. But this is I mean this actually has a lot of similarities to the the Volcanian that I really liked was the the Turbo Volk that we had sort of before um, Guardians Rising came out. Uh, uh, oh yeah, um, the and, and this, Yeah, and this kind of has the same feel to it because you're just like zooming in and powering up super fast and taking those one hit KOs before they can get to you um, but anyway um, so I think we've covered the, the biggest strengths of the deck pretty well is there anything that, that you want to mention that we haven't talked about uh, as far as the strength of the deck yeah um, uh, I would touch up on a little bit on on ha having the supporter count, um, I noticed that even though most people look at the list and say, you know, you don't have many supporters, uh, I found myself um, never really needing anything beyond what I had in the deck at the time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, of course, with uh, Shaman, uh, it makes it a little bit easier uh, because uh, because you can actually play the cards in your hand uh, let's say you need a grass energy, for example. You can diff that grass energy a little bit better. You know, have you know having extra like, you know, two to three cards, um, and not having to discard valuable resources. Um, you know, let's say you have you know you already have a Vicar Bolt up. You have a rare candy and a, another Vicar Bolt in your hand that you don't need for the rest of the game. You can just discard those, play down like let's say a Fury Belt or something, um, and then like play like the next ball, for example, that's in your hand. You can actually. Uh, play your hand out to where you can shame in for a lot more cards than if you had two useless cards and then via seeker then another second more in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it makes I it think, a lot easier. I think that, that that is a play that has come in clutch for me so many times. It's just playing my hand down and in some cases being able to use like a Skyla to get one piece of the puzzle that I like definitely need and then having an ultra ball to then grab shaman and you know refresh my hands get four or five six new cards to find something that'll either help me out you know next turn or or sometimes even that turn <laughs> a lot of times it is that grass energy but yeah i think it's interesting because this deck actually makes use of shaman more than like anything that's currently viable other than I guess like a Decidueye type deck but that's just trying to turbo through your deck which isn't what he's what she's here yeah, for um, I only use Shaman if I absolutely have to like um, pretty much I don't, I don't use anything in my deck really unless I absolutely have to mm -hmm. so like um, like I'll sit on hands I'll just keep cards in my hand uh, for like a couple turns until I need to use them like you know, you know regardless of uh if I have a supporter or not, and, uh, you know, um, that can also give the impression that, you know, I don't really have anything, which, I mean, I, I can care less if my opponent knew, knew that or not, um, mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, as long as you're setting your board up to where you can actually win the game, regardless of what hand you have, your opponent can end you out of whatever you have currently and something else, and you'll still be fine. Sure. So, um, you know, that's, that's why I focus on getting set up getting everything I need out the first couple turns and then the rest of the game just comes uh, comes easy after that. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, 
and I've definitely experienced that too. Because uh, yeah, it's it's very very nice to be able to just kind of I I think you described it as just being on autopilot almost. I mean, it, it's not like that. There's always lots of close decisions. Right. But, but uh, it kind of like you can kind of do do whatever you know, turn after turn. Um, you know, just whatever the situation calls for. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you never, never really stuck. Yeah. Um, so uh, you mentioned earlier uh, the thought about putting in another energy recycler, which is like the first question anyone who's played any other Bully Volt list is like, you only have one recycler and you don't have a Brox? Um, I think recycler makes a lot more sense than Brock in this because you're not playing VS and you can use Skyla to get a recycler when you need it but you can't as easily search out a Brock and obviously that takes your supporter for the turn um, yeah, it's what I didn't you, want to do what would you take out for that second recycler uh, I mean it would be, it'd be a tough choice but it it would probably be an energy uh, probably a grass energy. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, I'd, I'd love to take a lightning out, but I don't want to uh, take away from uh, being able to attack with Coco, like for the electric ball, because that comes up uh, a lot more often than people probably think. Well, and, and um, also, it's a lot with the, you know, the count, obviously, having more grass you end up, even though you use two grass on a Bulu, it, it seems like more often than people expect, you end up not being able to strong charge because you don't have any lightning left. Mm -hmm. So I think well, I um, agree with you about um, not taking out a lightning, taking out a grass over a lightning if you were going to go that route. Right, yeah, because uh, uh, there's there's too many situations where uh, you know, you have like one prize or you have to discard one or two, and uh, that can come come back to bite you pretty hard. So, um, at least with the with the grass energies, um, you can still attack with one grass energy on on Bulu for you know forty to sixty damage uh, with the tool attach, mm -hmm. and then uh, you know clean it up with Coco. You know you can have a choice battle with Coco and clean up a one hundred seventy HP Pokemon with a combination of of you know two. You know, choice bands or furry belts. Yeah. So you can at least do that. You know, I'm not saying it's optimal, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, actually, it could be because then your opponent goes down to odd prizes. Yeah, which is is huge. That's you know, I I used to, and I I was actually just getting to asking you about thoughts on text. I used to have a a Fitz Collide Mew teched in, mm -hmm. and part of the strength was that he was a one prize attacker. So it was like an extra Bulu kind of, but he also was very fragile, which is the downside. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, and, there's and, been plenty of uh, Cocos that tank the hit. Yeah, you know, from either Lele or uh, you know Megros. I mean, there's there's a lot of things that that can't can't kill a 150 HP Coco in one hit. Yeah. yeah. Um. Are there any? So I know. You used to have a, a GX Coco in there, and you took him out uh, kind of for a, another baby, right? Right. Did you just find that Coco GX wasn't pulling his weight? Well, it was good. Um, I mean, I can't deny that I mean, it was a very powerful card in the deck. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, one thing I wanted to minimize on is um, having uh, fragile attackers. And uh, the GX attack uh, was far too situational for my taste, basically. Uh, whereas uh, Boo's GX attack is always going to be good. Like, always, like, 100% of the time is going to be good. Um, Coco, on top of that, had two retreat for a two-prize attacker. I, didn't, I did not want that uh, because you can't search it with heavy ball. And then you can't one retreat it. So it, it's kind of like that awkward spot where it's like there's really no advantage of running in the deck other than the fact that you can just surprise your opponent and swoop in, and that's just not good enough. That's not consistent enough for me. 
Okay. That makes sense. Um, other texts that I've heard people talk about that I think... <laughs> I actually played it for a while. Um, one of my testing partners did as well. Uh, it was a VicVolt GX, and I think everybody has realized that that just isn't as great as we all hoped. Uh, it, it broke my heart to, to not include that in the deck. Uh, believe me, I really wanted to make it work, but... Um, I really didn't even try it in, in the deck. Um, just played like a few games with it, and I'm like, "This is coming out. It's just terrible." Um, because there's really, there's literally like no situation where you actually want it, other than playing against evolution decks. And usually, you're gonna run over the evolution decks anyway because you're just too fast. Um, so there's really no point of trying to set up two different stage twos uh, and uh, hurt your consistency of the deck. There's really no good way to search out. Vicable GX as well. I mean, if it was three retreat, I'd play one. Uh, but being at, at one or two, it's just it's just very bad in my opinion because you have to ultra ball forage. Mm -hmm. You don't want to discard resources to set up to try to set, set up a secondary stage two that won't that won't really help you in ninety percent of your matches. Yeah, I dig. Uh, are there any other texts that you've considered that you think are may have their place? Um, uh, I mean, depending on the meta, uh, potentially uh, Stunfisk with the Revenge Attack, because, you know, you can just send it up uh, and, uh, you know, do 100 damage or you know, 110 damage, and it'll sit there with 150 HP, and you can two-shot uh, EXs and GXs with it. Um, after, like, let's say you... Uh, you take a knockout, well, your opponent takes a knockout, you send him up, strong charge to it without having to attach from the hand, do 100 damage, uh, or well, 130, 100, you know, or 110 if you have a fury belt. And uh, you can do some tricky plays uh, with it, um, you know, like with field blower, and then attach a choice man, knock out a GX. But that's, you know, it's a little bit too cute, but, you know, if, if you're playing like a lightning weak meta, I'd definitely say play one, because there's three retreat. So you can actually just heavy ball for it, send it up, you know, retreat, pre-retreat your Coco, and get 100 damage in. But um, other than that, there's not really any other text that, um, I mean, because I went through pretty much every card that, that was available, and there's not really any other good text other than the GX, the, the Coco GX. At least to me there, I mean, maybe somebody else found something, but I didn't find anything else that was very useful. Sure, sure. Um, okay, so I, I, <laughs> I moved away before I asked it. Um, we, we definitely covered the strengths now, I think. Uh, what about weaknesses of this deck? Uh, Hex Maniac. That's, that's pretty bad. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, not, not getting your Vic Volt out can be pretty bad, obviously. Yeah. Um, but uh, I did win a game at uh, at internationals uh, without getting a single grubbing on the bench, nice. so that was pretty cool. But uh, uh, that's that's about it. Like, it's, uh, oh yeah, and uh, like 240 HP Pokemon, that's pretty tough. So sure. the Sigui, it's a little bit harder uh, with item lock. Um, otherwise, you know, if, if it's without item lock, you know, let's say like the Sigui Nine Tails. It does fine, but having a 240 HP Pokemon while uh, having item lock, it's pretty tough for the deck to overcome. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, there's, there's not really any other like weaknesses of the deck, which is one reason why I chose the deck. In, in those matchups against the the you know 220, 230, 240, 250 HP, is that where fighting Fury Belt on Bulu becomes even more important? Yeah, that's one reason why I played the free belts is because of those uh, those tanky 240, 250 HP Pokemon, um, and and Drampo, of course, because you can just you can just come up and one shot a Boo, and I'd rather for that to not happen. Sure, sure. Um, Zorg Break uh, was a weakness of the deck. Uh, that's one thing that kind of kept me from uh, deciding on it earlier because uh, it. Uh, one of my friends actually talked me into uh, playing playing the deck again because I was going to play Espeon Garb because of the Zarg uh, Drampa deck. Mm -hmm. 
And I'm like, you know what? You know, how about I just put in another cocoa um, and just uh, put a high count of fury belt in. And that should solve, like, majority of the problems that the deck had. Because the deck had a lot of weaknesses before that change. Um, so I think uh, that that's what pushed me to, to actually play that deck again after my friend talked uh, talked to me about it. Sure. That makes sense. Uh, how frequently do you end up getting multiple Vigil Volts out? Uh, very often. Okay. Uh, well, well, in, in the matchups that I actually get multiple on the bench. Um, some matches I don't even bother putting a second one on the bench, but uh, I think every game where I had a sec- second one on the bench, maybe except one, uh, just because I killed my opponent too fast, um, I, I got a second uh, blue up. Okay. Uh, I mean, I blew um, Vickabolt up, um, where uh, I'll go either turn two double Vickabolt. I do that probably, probably like 70-80% of the time I have two Grubbins mm-hmm. on the bench. And then um, the other times I just do turn turn uh, turn two Vickabolt, turn three Vickabolt. And then uh, the games usually end pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah, at that point, I would imagine but, uh, so. Um, it just all depends on on what the matchup is. Sometimes, like against Espion Garb, I'll put uh, two on the bench uh, just because of the divide. And if they both stay alive, um, I usually get both up. And then that way, um, whenever I do hit a um, a field blower on a Garbage Toxin, I get two strong charges. And then the game's usually over at that point. Yeah. Um. So. Common turn one scenario. You're playing Bridget, obviously, right? Yeah, Play usually. Or, yeah. Um, and are you? So if if you have, I assume if you have a Grubbin out, you're gonna get mostly two Bulus and another Grubbin. Sometimes throw a Coco in there. And if you have a Bulu out, you're gonna get mostly two Grubbins and a Bulu sometimes throwing a cocoa in instead. Is that mm-hmm. roughly accurate? Yeah, that's pretty accurate. Um, uh, I mean, it's kind of rare, though, that I go for two blues. Um, the, only, the only matchup that I go for two blues is if I'm going against, like, a ninja. Uh, okay. So uh, you, or a Volcanian. You, you tend to go more for getting one blue out and then uh, the cocoa and the multiple Vic Volts if necessary. Yeah, I usually, yeah, usually go for... Um, if I don't have a Grubbin already out, sometimes I'll go for two Grubbin and a Bulu, or two Grubbin and a Coco. I don't always get Bulu out turn one, uh, just because I can always heavy ball for that. You know, I can scout for heavy ball, and there we go. But uh, my, my primary um, choices are usually one Bulu, one Vic Volt, I mean, well, Grubbin, and then one Coco. That's usually okay. why I grab off Bridget. Okay. That's different than I have played it. And I, I wonder, I th- like I, I think I mentioned before, I think I'm underutilizing Coco. So mm-hmm. um, that'll be a change I, I play around with for sure. Um, yeah, Coco is like, probably the all-star of the deck, honestly. Okay, cool. Uh, real quick... Well, I guess we sort of talked about it. Um, I was going to say matchups, um, and I guess just get like a sentence on each, um, or you could just say easy for everyone if you want. <laughs> oh, that's um, that's Espeon not going to for some of them. <laughs> oh, Espeon Garb, uh, it's almost auto win. Drample well, Garb. Well, uh, depending on how you play, but um, Drample Garb, uh, it's pretty much uh, that's. That's highly favorable. A little bit harder than Espeon Guard, but it's highly favorable. What what makes that harder than Espeon? Well, the fact that they pressure with Jeff very quickly, uh, being able for them uh, being able to one hit KO your Vicka Volt. So if you have to discard all your energy and then they follow up with a you know, and this is if you 
that's if you take a like a one prize knockout on a on like a trubbish or something before uh, you can uh, knock out a a drampa. You know, so if you go down to five prizes, it's a lot harder. If you go down to four prizes early, uh, you pretty much win the game because then they can't knock they they can't swing with any more drampas the rest of the game. Because uh, then I knock out the drampa, then I you know bring up a lele. But if you take a uh, if you go down to five prizes starting out, it's a lot harder because then you have to go through three drampas. Uh, but the, the fact that you have to discard your energy to knock out their drampa, and then either they get garbatoxin up and you can't uh, you can't one hit KO. Uh, I mean, and, uh, you can't hit the field bore. You're not going to be able to one-hit KO, and then they're just going to do 150, 180 every turn. The reason why Espeon Garb is not going to be that hard is because while you have no energy, they can't do much damage, uh, especially because you don't use that many items to begin with. Uh, sure. And then you can just re- you switch or you know escape rope to get out of the confusion if, if they chose to do that. Uh, whereas uh, Jamp of Garb uh, just all depends on how you play the matchup with your energies. If you're conservative with your energy... Um, uh, if you like leave with Co- Tapu Coco, it makes it a lot easier because in that way you can uh, have a Fury Belt and you can use the GX attack uh, to heal the damage. Let's say they hit you for 150, 180, you can heal that off while knocking out their Drampa because they had 20 damage on it. So, you, so you you'll the, go ahead and flying flip in a, a Drampa match? Yeah, oh yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, because they're going to have damage on their, their Pokemon anyway. Um, uh, that's, that's, that's if you go second. If you go second, you're going to want to fly and flip. If you go first, uh, you don't you don't ever want to fly and flip. Uh, you always want to go with uh, with Bulu, knock, start knocking out the Drampas. You just want to do it as soon as possible. Uh, but if you go second, they already have that first energy attachment. They're going to start running through your board, um, getting garbage, your garbage toxin set up. And uh, if you're able to put damage on everything that they have, not just their trubbishes, you know, or not, or not just their lele. Um, cause you, you know, you don't, we don't want to take a knockout on their, on their trubbish, uh, whenever, whenever you're being smashed for 180. Yeah. You know, you don't want to have to discard your energy. So you want to put that, that damage on it. Uh, that way you can just knock out whatever you want, whenever you want it. Sure. Okay, um, Zorak Drampa, I think we kind of talked about that. Oh, for, uh, <laughs> it, it used to be really hard on the Fighting Fury Belt. Makes oh, yeah, it, it used to be almost an all loss. It, it used to be very unfavorable. Uh, with Fury Belts and with the Cocos in now, it's actually highly favorable. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not auto-win by any means, but uh, it, it swings back to like 60-40, 65-35, depending on uh, basically how quickly... Each person sets up. If you set up as normal, you should win that matchup almost every time. Um, well, at least in a two out of three match. Um, you may you may drop a game every every match, but uh, if you play it right, you're not going to have to worry about uh, Zorg Break hurting you too much. You know, if you spread twenty to everything, now you can one shot all their uh, well, not really one shot, but finish off all their uh, breaks while you have a Fury Belt on it using the one twenty attack. Instead of discarding energies, yeah, yeah, or having to use your GX attack, so it sets you up in a really good position to where they always have to keep on attaching energy and try to keep up, and they're not going to be able to hit you with Drampa ever in the game. So uh, you, you you literally have nothing to worry about as long as you do get a flying flip off. I like it. Uh, nine tails. Uh, t- well, which version? The straight nine tails. Yeah, I, I think water box is too clunky to. Uh, water box. About. Oh, you, you just auto win. Yeah. There's no. There's almost no chance for. Uh, the reason why I say that is because uh, they have to. They have to keep aqua patching. Yeah. In order to keep up. Um. Uh, if you take a night, if you flying flip once, uh, uh, before they can rough these, or if you just catch choice van, then you can just knock out all the nine tails. Uh, turn after turn, they have no way to stop your abilities other than Hex Maniac. Mm-hmm. So, you can just keep on attaching every turn, doing 210, 210, 210. So, um, now there's a way that they can win. If they do, if they are able to Hex Maniac chain, 
then it's going to be rough. <laughs> sure. Sure. Okay. Um, but uh, against the Sidgwai Ninetales, it's a little bit harder. Okay. Uh, that's, that's probably about even for the Sidgwai Ninetales. And then um, Ninetales with, uh, like, anything else, it just all depends on what they're playing in their deck. Sure. So, 50-50 with the Sidgwai. Uh, at least slightly unfavorable to Sidgwai with Plume. Yeah, it's unfavorable for... Yeah, the Sidgwai Plume is uh, probably... Probably, like, highly unfavorable if you go second. If you go first, it's by even. Okay. So, it's not a good matchup at all. Um, Falk. Oh, okay, it's even. And then the one that everyone uh, talks about for this deck, Metagross. Uh, slightly unfavorable. With the Fury Belt version, like the Coco and Fury Belt. Um, the reason why it's not favorable is because, uh, you know, they can still Kukui over the, the Fury Belt on your uh, the Coco mm -hmm. if you have the Fury Belt as well. Um, not only that, but they also can play Max Potion. So the fact that they play field blowers and max potions, and they also some play hex maniac, uh, it just it's just really iffy. So even with the text in the deck, I mean, it's still not going to be favorable. Sure. Yeah, I, I think that has been what I've seen too. Um, and then, have you tested this? With adjustments against like Guardi, um, I have not. Okay, but uh, it's 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 probably gonna be unfavorable. Um, there's almost no way for Bulu to be able to keep up um, unless you're strong charging every single turn, um, because you can't keep energies on the Bulu. You just can't. I mean, unless your opponent doesn't have a Gardevoir out, but and you can just run through the board. It shouldn't be a problem. Sure, but. Uh, can outspeed them sometimes for sure with that. I mean that applies to Metagross too. That that's how I have won against Metagross is times that I outspeed them, which certainly happens, but um, not enough to make it favorable. Um, what about playing a Kakui if Guardi becomes big? Uh, that's an interesting inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really like it without Via Seekers, uh, but it could make its way into the list uh, just because, I mean, if, it, if, if it's closer than I think, I'd probably put the Kukui in. Um, if it's still going to be, if it's still going to be tough, I'm not even going to bother putting it in because there's no other matchup that it really helps in other than like Ninetales. So, sure. um, I mean, it helps in every matchup, of course, but... Uh, like enough to where it, you know, it would swing a matchup like yeah, yeah, highly in my favor to you know to be worth the space in the deck. Uh, it doesn't swing anything highly in, in favor at all. So it's just a one of, uh, and then I had to start polluting my deck with uh, VS Seekers in order to really get the most use out of it. So it may not even be worth putting in. And then, uh, I guess, I think the last thing I've got... Well, uh, no, I've got two more questions. <laughs> okay. Um, Post-rotation, uh, obviously, the only thing we lose, because we're already going to switch for Guzma, the only thing we really lose is Shaman, but that's kind of a big loss. That That is, that's actually a huge loss for the deck. Uh, I mean, it can do fine without it, but um, the deck is just beyond broken with it. Mm -hmm. Uh um, especially because at any point in the game, uh, being able to just draw a whole new hand of six cards without having to use your supporters is insane. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, when we get to that point, what would you think would make sense to try to keep it alive, or are you even trying? Oh, no, I'm, I'm a still try with it. Uh, it's my favorite deck, so, sure. um, I'm probably going to test a lot with it uh, for the upcoming standard form uh, standard regionals. 
Um, I'm not probably not gonna play it for expanded just because uh, I mean there's other decks that are gonna be better. Yeah. But uh, for standard, I'm definitely gonna be trying trying my hardest to make it work. See what I can come up with. Talk with some friends. See what they come up with. You know, because like people back in St. Louis are really good, so they can come up with some good ideas. Do you have any? I mean, the the obvious thought is well, try sticking in a third lele, but yeah, it's not know. that simple though. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think it is either. Yeah, because yeah. I, I mean, I really don't utilize lele that much, other than like maybe the first turn. Mm-hmm. So, um, but after that, I use it, you know, maybe just to grab like you know a Lysander or something later on, um, but. Usually it's not really that necessary, but you want to always have at least two in your deck, no matter what deck you're playing. <laughs> I, I will say there was one game, right? Everyone's got their. Well, there was this one game. Everyone's got that story, right? I had oh. <laughs> one game <laughs> where, for whatever reason, like I just couldn't get a Bulu out to save my life. But I had Lele out. I think I think that like they had managed to KO the Bulu, and I couldn't get another one out. Like maybe two of them were prized and I played recycler and then I just started stacking energies onto Lele and I ended up getting all 12 energies onto the Lele and <laughs> it was against Decidueye and I one shot a Decidueye with a Lele. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it was beautiful. Yeah. That... It shouldn't happen, but <laughs> somehow yeah. it like actually worked and, and happened. Hey, you know, sometimes sometimes it comes down to that. You know, they're uh, at the um, I think once at the regional, once at the at the IC. Um, uh, I actually stacked like eight, nine, ten energies on on Lele uh, to take a knockout. Um, you know, being able to uh, just pretty much kill anything you want uh, is nice. Um, but the only problem though is, I mean, the game will have to be. You know, like a very dragged out game that your opponent's not really drawn that well in. Mm-hmm. So, um, it doesn't, it's not going to happen at all, like pretty much ever. So, I mean, yeah. once, uh, t- uh, twice out of uh, 30 rounds, uh, that's not very often. Yeah. Yeah. And then I guess the last thing I wanted to ask about was um, to what extent do you? set up like a, a backup attacker in like a, a second Bulu or, or um, I guess that's right because you, you're already talking that generally you end up with a, a Coco of really fast and a Bulu mm-hmm. coming in behind him but it, how often do you end up setting up an additional Bulu while uh, they're still alive uh, not like that often like, do you just kind of maybe get one grass on him and then wait as long as your abilities are in in play? Yeah, like, um, yeah. One thing I uh, this is actually one thing that is probably making a lot of people think that you need like a second recycler in the deck or you know rock Sprit is strong charging just because they can. Mm-hmm. Um, like you never want a strong charge. If I mean let's say you know, let's say you're in a good position, you know. Um, you know, you don't need to set up multiple attackers, or let's say something may change later on. You don't ever want a strong charge, uh, like your last few energies, uh, just because you have no options the following turn. You have no way to put the energies back in the deck, uh, other than energy recycler. So being able to have energies in your deck at uh, at all times, your opponent pretty much can't do anything without you being able to counter it. Uh, so, like, let's say, for example, like, um, they uh, use, like, a Tapu Lele, for example, to, to hit your Bulu. And they have a Bulu on backup, knowing that, you know, you, you know you're going to uh, get return KO'd. You know, if you keep the energies in the deck, um, you don't have to worry about, like, let's say you, you want to KO the the Lele, discarding all your energies, right? Mm-hmm. Now, what what you just present them the opportunity for is to Lysander your Bulu with the energy on it. 
kill the Bulu with the energy on it. Now you have no energies. Uh, whereas, you know, okay, um, you knock out the active Bulu, now I'm going to strong charge to the new one. Sure. They have no way to knock off your energy on the board. As long as those energies are in the deck. So, yeah. uh, that's one thing I, I see a lot of people falling victim to is, is, uh, having their only energy knocked down off the board because they're forced to discard off their active Bulu and then they get the bench one knocked out or whatever has energy on it. So always leave yourself with the option or let's say you need to, uh, do an odd prize, uh, situation. If you put the energies on the Bulu, now you can't charge up your cocoa. You know, and then buy yourself time to find your energy recycler to get a knockout the following turn without having to discard your energies, and then you can sweep their board from there, as opposed to uh, you attacking with the Bulu, discarding your energies, uh, or either keeping them and then having your Bulu knocked out. Now you're forced to find your recycler that turn. Otherwise, they're going to sweep you. So it's just little stuff like that, you know, or put energy on something that you don't have to put energy on. Um, You know, I see people like you'll put like energy on two different Vicka Volts. You never want to do that. Like, unless you're playing against Greninja, you never want to do that. Yeah, well, Greninja should be easy as long as you just like get Bulu energized once. I guess that would be a matchup where I would say you probably do want to energize a backup. Anything, I guess anything where you're hitting weakness, having a backup Bulu energized is probably helpful because you don't have to discard. But other than that, I, I, I think, yeah, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. That's probably something I've done wrong too. Although I've gotten better about it. Anyway, with that, I think we've covered all the questions I had. Well, thanks for for doing all of this, John. All right. uh, it's been eye opening. Um, do you have any shout outs you want to give or anything like that? Uh, well, my uh, team back in St. Louis, uh, Yeti Gaming. Um, you know, Colin Lavelle. Uh, he needs to hurry up and get his invite. He's due for one. He's a great player, so um, I'm hoping that he can get one. Uh, Jack Carter. Uh, yeah, he's also looking for his, so uh, I'm pretty sure that, you know, yeah, they play this uh, season uh, to its entirety. They for sure have their invite, so, um, you know, good luck to those guys. Uh, everyone else, I mean, they, they've gotten their invites um, that, that play at most of the regionals, so, um, yeah, Jay Young, uh, Zach, Alex, uh, Crackler, yeah, they're pretty good, um, and, uh, uh, Lavelle Levette, um, he's actually the one who actually talked me into playing Bulu for Nationals uh, after I like played back to the side. So, shout out to him. So, yeah. Um, cool. Oh yeah, and uh, Ricky Neheiser, um, he's uh, he's actually wanted to talk me back into playing Escape Road in the deck, which came up clutch a lot. Yeah, so. I've loved that card since I brought it in after your Madison. Or after your NAIC post. Uh, all right. Well, cool. Thanks again, man. All right. Thanks for having me.